Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the next instalment of our research webinar series, which is part of our Staying Connected programme. Tonight, Professor Graham Cook will be giving us an overview of what immunotherapy is and talk about his new research to see if oncolytic viruses can be used to help treat ovarian cancer. Graham is a professor of molecular and cellular immunology at the University of Leeds. He leads this immunology research group in the department and teaches immunology to medical students at the university. His research interests include studying the molecular and cellular mechanisms of human immunity, in particular understanding the biology of a type of immune cell called natural killer cells and their role in anti-tumor immunity. So it's fair to say that Graham is an expert on the immune system and how it can be utilized to kill cancers. His recent research, including looking at melanoma and glioblastoma, but now Graham is turning his attention to ovarian cancer. So before I hand over to you, Graham, um, I just want everyone to know that you can ask questions via the chat box function and the Q&A function as well. And Graham will be able to answer these questions towards the end of the session after he's finished presenting. I'll also include some of the questions that were sent in beforehand, so thank you to anyone who sent in a question when they signed up. We do kindly ask that you do not ask any personal medical questions. So thank you so much, Graham, for taking the time to um, talk to us about your research today, and I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Faye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to, to talk to you this evening. Um, I hope you are all got... A cup of tea or something like that and uh, I'm going to talk to you about immunotherapy a little bit about immunotherapy in general and then I'm going to tell you about our new ovarian cancer action funded project which is just about to start where we're trying to design new approaches to uh, immunotherapy for use in ovarian cancer as Faye said I'm I hope everybody can see this little red dot on the screen, which I'm going to use to, to point to a few things during the presentation. So I'm from the University of Leeds School of Medicine. Uh, I'm sitting in, the, uh, sitting in my attic where I've been sitting since pretty much since the end of March last year, like, like many people. Um, OK, so let's get started. So what's immunotherapy? Well, there isn't really a, a formal definition. If you want the closest thing to a formal definition and you can go to the to the Cancer Research UK website and you can you can find a definition there and they say that immunotherapy uses our immune system to fight cancer it works by helping the immune system recognize and attack cancer cells so it's it's you know it's fairly straightforward it's about exploiting the immune system to attack cancer and I think everybody is now much more familiar with the immune system than they were a year ago. We've had lots of discussion over the last year and lots of, uh, lots of indications of how, um, how well we can manipulate the immune system. We've got this COVID vaccine in record time and everything. That's, that's an immunotherapy if you like. It's just an immunotherapy for an infectious disease. You're exploiting the immune system to, to attack, in that case, the virus. We're doing the same sort of thing but attacking cancer cells okay right so it's about exploiting your immune system but what's your immune system well your immune system is is lots and lots of different cells and molecules that are found circulating around in the blood but they're also found throughout your body now down the microscope all of these cells look look very very similar white blood cells is what they really are but they all have a different job and on closer inspection the different immune cells uh, are quite different and I've got a little analogy here uh, I'm slightly obsessed with fire engines so here we are so here's our here's our fire station with one two three four five fire engines sitting outside of it now in an emergency the fire brigade will send the right fire engine to fight the fire but actually when you look at them they all look pretty much the same you can see that these four here look quite familiar this one on the end looks a little bit different actually if you look a bit more closely this one's got a big ladder on the top and these haven't but i mean these all really do look the same 
But actually, of course, all the different fire engines at your fire station, they all have a slightly different role. They've all got a specialised role. So in an emergency, the fire brigade sends the right fire engine to the fire. It's got the equipment on it that it needs. In the same way, it, the immune system sends the right immune cell to attack the infection or to attack the cancer. Yeah? How can you work out what the different fire engines do? How could you work out what the different immune cells do? Well, a good way to do that would be to go up to the fire engines and open them up, open up the lockers, see what they've got inside them, see what they, you know, what you think the different pieces of equipment can do. We do exactly the same sort of thing with cells. We take the different sorts of cells, we open them up, we study the contents of the cells, what molecules are in them. Can we learn about what the cells do by looking at the molecules inside the cells? And we look at those in two ways, and I'm going to keep the analogy going for a bit. So we look at cells in the blood, which is a bit like fire engines at the fire station, ready to go, not doing anything particular, but ready to be used. But we also look, or immunologists look at immune cells at the site of infection and at the cancer site, which would be like the fire engines at the fire, what they're actually doing at the fire. Yeah? So by comparing them in the blood, and at the cancer site, we can learn again about what the different immune cells are doing. We spend a lot of time trying to understand what the different immune cells in a human being do and how they work to attack cancer cells or, or how they work to, to modulate the disease. And what immunotherapy is about is taking that knowledge of what's in the different immune cells and how they work and exploiting them exploiting them to make the immune cells work more efficiently to attack the cancer. Okay, so that's enough about fire engines for the moment. So what does it really do? Well, again, this slide's probably a bit out of date now because we all know, don't we, that the immune system protects you against coughs and colds and chicken pox and the flu. And we could, of course, have COVID-19 here, couldn't we? There's many, many more things that the immune system protects you against. Most of the time, I'm pleased to say, we don't even know that the immune system is doing something. We might pick up a bug and the immune system recognises it, takes care of it without you ever falling ill, ever noticing anything. So if you ask yourself how you get better when you pick up a bug, you might say, well, I, I, I reach for the, for, the, for the paracetamol. And that's absolutely right. Paracetamol, that kind of thing, does help you feel better. But... The thing that really gets rid of that infection is your immune system. So your immune system's working all the time to eliminate infection, but it also, of course, can... So your immune system detects the infection and kills it off, but it can also um, attack cancer cells. Now, the immune system and cancer for... for a, for many, many years, people argued about whether the immune system really was important in controlling cancer. And it wasn't probably until 25, 30 years ago that the, the answers were, were that people finally agreed. And that everybody now agrees that the immune system, yes, the immune system can detect cancer and it can fight cancer and it can get rid of cancer. And I'm gonna show you a very, very simple little example of it doing that here. And what you can see down here, this big cell here, which I hope you can see, is just sort of a pinky color with a green nucleus here. This is, this is a cancer cell sitting in a dish, okay? And this very bright green cell here is an immune cell called a natural killer cell, which is the ones that we really like. And what you're going to see when I run the video is you're going to see this immune cell look at this cancer cell and then decide what to do. I'll run the video through once, you can watch it, and then I'll run it through again and explain a little bit more about what it's doing. Which of course I can't do because I've got the laser pointer. Um, here we go. Right, there's the immune cell having a little wander about. Oh, now watch, you see the cancer cell shrivels up. 
and you get all those little blobs on it. And this, of course, is a taken down the microscope, speeded up many times. So that all of that happened over the course of well, just under half an hour. OK, so that immune cell attacked that cancer cell and killed it in the space of half an hour. So I'll run it again and I'll try and explain what's happening. So here's the immune cell. It attaches itself to the cancer cell, that red flash. And then you get the cancer cell dying. OK, and what the red flash is, is it's because the in, in, the, in the dish with the cells is a, is a red dye. And the red dye is quite dilute in the dish. But what this cell does, what the immune cell does, is it punches holes in the membrane, in the, in the skin, if you like, of the tumour cell. And those holes allow the red dye that's in the, in the dish to rush into the cancer cell. And it's that rushing in of the contents of the outside the cell and also things that this cell delivers in through those holes that kills the cell. So I'm going to show it once more and you watch for that red flash as the dye rushes in showing that the, the immune cell is making holes in the in the cancer cell. One more time. Here we go. Watch for the red flash. There you go. That's the holes being made. The molecules rushing in from the immune cell, the dye rushing in from the medium. And this these funny structures around the tumor cell show us that it's dying this is a dead tumor cell okay and this 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 little video was was made by colleagues of ours in, in australia a very nice little example of how an immune cell can attack a cancer cell but okay so if the immune system's so great if immune cells can detect cancer cells what why do we get why do we get cancer you know we've got immune cells if we get cancer the immune cells should deal with it and it should go away. Well, it's a battle, of course, and it's a, it's a battle between the cancer cells and your immune system. Let's get the pointer back on. Okay. It's a battle between cancer cells and your immune system, just as it's a battle between the infection and your immune system. Exactly the same way. It's a little bit harder for the immune system to detect cancer cells than it is for the immune system to detect infections like viruses and there's there's a very good reason for that and that is because immunologists often say that the immune system is good at, at distinguishing self from non-self so generally speaking the immune system does not attack self doesn't you don't want your immune system to attack your own tissues you want it to attack non-self things like bacteria and viruses. So the immune system has evolved to do that, really, to attack non-self. But cancer, of course, is made up of your own cells that have gone rogue. They've gone out of control a bit. And that makes the, so the immune system still sees them largely as being self tissue your own tissue so it's a bit reluctant to attack it however there are we now know that there are enough changes that occur in a cancer cell like mutations that you get in the dna and that sort of thing that do make it start to look different than your surrounding healthy tissue and so the immune system can begin to recognize the cancer cells and attack them but again okay why why is it why is it stopping? Well, it looks like the immune system is very good at controlling cancer in the early stages. So if you can imagine how a cancer might start, it'll start with one cell gone, gone wrong, and that will become two cells and four cells and as it divides. The immune system will get alerted. There'll be changes occurring in those cells. The immune system will start to look at those cells and maybe start to recognize them and kill them off. It might kill them all off, great, your cancer won't develop. However, what might also happen is as your cancer cell develops, as your cancer cells grow and you get more and more cancer cells, maybe they start to pick up mutations in their DNA and that sort of thing. And maybe that stops them being recognized by the immune system. So your, your cancer will grow in slightly different ways and some cells will be susceptible to the immune system and they will be killed off but some will be resistant to the immune system 
and they will grow regardless of what your immune cells are trying to do. So as the cancer grows, it stops the immune cells from working well. And you end up with a situation where you end up with a, with a, with a tumor that's got lots of immune cells in it and around it. Looks like there's evidence of, of the immune system attacking the tumor, but actually they're not able to do very much. The cancer is holding them back, if you like. So the goal of immunotherapy is to tip that balance back in favor of your immune system. So to take it from a situation where the immune cells are there but not doing anything to a situation where they're there and attacking the cancer. That's what immunotherapy is all about. Does it work? Well, yes, there have been some really good successes for some cancers. Now, I've got a few examples here. Some people might not consider the first two examples to be immunotherapy. I think you can call them immunotherapy. Um, one of the great successes is in breast cancer. And some, treat, some patients are treated with this antibody called Herceptin, which some people might know as Trastuzumab. It's easier to say Herceptin than it is to say Trastuzumab. And some lymphomas are treated with this antibody called Rituximab. Now, both of these antibodies, Herceptin and Rituximab, They've been engineered in the lab to recognize the cancer cells and you get an infusion of the antibody. It accumulates on the surface of the cancer cells and part of the action of that antibody, not all of its action, but part of the action of that antibody is to recruit immune cells into the cancer and they see a thing coated with antibody and they say, oh, it's coated with antibody. It must be something wrong. I'll attack it. And that's part of the action of Herceptin, which is a fantastic drug for breast cancer, and Rituximab, a fantastic antibody for lymphomas. Part of their action is to recruit the immune system and help to control those cancers. And those have been approved now for about for more than 20 years, and they're very safe and, and, and good therapies. We've had newer developments in, in immunotherapy, and these are really the, the, probably the, the treatments that have caused the most excitement in the field and have made people really start to reevaluate immunotherapy for many different cancer types. And it really goes back to, to melanoma, skin cancer, which was the first cancer to be successfully treated with this thing called immune checkpoint blockade. And this is, again, this, this uses antibodies, um, but unlike the, the, the breast cancer treatment and the lymphoma treatment that I told you about, these antibodies, they don't attack the cancer cell at all they actually stick to the immune cells and they stop the immune cells from being switched off. So they actually, so your immune system has, gets switched on naturally by infection or by cancer, but it also gets switched off naturally by infection and cancer because you need to control it. What a tumor might do is it, it exploits that switching off type of control. What these antibodies do is they stick to the immune cells and stop the tumor from switching them off. So there you might have a cancer with immune cells in it. You get the antibody and the antibody, if you like, wakes up the immune cells and then they can start attacking the cancer. And that's, that's been really quite successful for melanoma treatment. It's become an approved therapy in the last few years for melanoma and also some other cancers. Um, so for example, some lung cancers can be treated quite successfully with, with, with these antibodies. Um, another development are these things called CAR T cells, which have recently been approved uh, by the NHS. And these are at the moment used for leukemias and lymphomas. So those are blood cancers, if you like. And these are where you take uh, cells from the patient. So you take blood cells from a patient you modify those blood cells in the lab so that they're more able to recognize the cancer cells and then you put them infuse them back into the patient enabling those cells to hunt down and destroy the cancer it's it's a very um it, it's it's a very labor intensive um medicine if you like because each medicine is prepared for each patient individually um, but it's, it's really quite successful for these types of cancers. And now people are trying to develop this approach for what we call solid cancers, of which ovarian cancer would be one of them. Um, melanoma ha is also has an approved therapy called TVEC, 
and TVEC is an oncolytic virus, which is what I'm going to tell you about a bit later on. This is a virus that's relatively, well, it is a harmless virus to you, um, but what it does, it has the unusual property that it replicates preferentially in cancer cells. So the virus gets, you, you infuse the virus into the patient or you, you, in the case of melanoma, you would inject it into the lesion on the skin and the virus gets into the cancer cells, replicates and bursts open the cells, destroying the cancer cells. That's originally how they were thought to work. Now we know that oncolytic viruses work by getting into the cancer cells and bursting them open, fantastic. But what, they, what this bursting mechanism does, if you like, is it alerts the immune system to the fact there's something going on and that gives you an, an immune response against the cancer. Okay, does immunotherapy work in ovarian cancer? That's what we want to do, isn't it? So if you take the drugs that have been used very successfully in melanoma and you use them in exactly the same way in ovarian cancer, then they, they, they don't work nearly as well as they do in melanoma. And I can explain why that is a bit later on. So when the success in melanoma was announced a few years ago, of course, the, the next step was to take these drugs, these antibodies, and use and try them in clinical trials in lots of different cancer types. And some have responded very well, but others have not responded very well, not as responded as well. So at the moment, we don't have a fantastic immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. What people are trying to do now is they're saying, okay, it might not work exactly as it works in melanoma, but let's, let's try it in combination with other drugs. And this is the way many successful uh, cancer drug therapies work. You don't use one drug that, that does everything for you. You probably use a combination of drugs or a combination of approaches. So for example, for, for, for breast cancer where you use Herceptin, you don't just use the Herceptin antibody on its own, but for example, you might have um, several rounds of conventional chemotherapy to, to reduce the tumor. And then you might have the antibody for a few, a few rounds of antibody to get rid of the last remaining cells. Then you might have surgery to get rid of anything that's remaining. And then you probably have a course of radiotherapy. And I think that's the way that many of these immunotherapies are going to go in the future. So the fact that these antibodies don't work in ovarian cancer at the moment, what people are trying to do is take those antibodies and similar sorts of approaches and, and try them in combination with other drugs, in combination with, with chemotherapy, to see if altering these treatments slightly can give a better approach. Um, our approach is a little bit different. Our, well, the combination we're going to use, well, we're going to start off by using a thing called an oncolytic virus. These are these viruses that get into the cancer cells, kill them, and uh, activate the immune system. But we're not going to use conventional oncolytic viruses. We're using a thing that we're going to call a next generation oncolytic virus. So the next development, if you like. And I'll try and show you about those in a minute. OK, so this is what we're going to try and do in our, in our project. So we're developing oncolytic viruses to treat ovarian cancer. So what does oncolytic mean? Well, you can recognize onco there. So that's cancer and lytic for bursting. So that's, that's the way they originally thought to work. The virus gets into the cancer cell, replicates and bursts the cancer open, killing it. Great stuff. We now know that they do that, but what they also do is they activate the immune system. That's part of our interest in them. And we've worked on oncolytic viruses in Leeds for quite a few years. Um, as Faye said, my interest in oncolytic viruses has come from the fact that I'm interested in a cell called a natural killer cell, which was the one in the video. And those are, those are cells of your immune system that are involved in, um, in attacking both virus infected cells and cancer cells. So they're, they're a good way for an oncolytic virus to work. So I'm going to show you some work that we did a few years ago uh, on, on an oncolytic virus. Um, and this was in patients who had uh, liver cancers. And so these patients had a liver cancer and they were given uh, large doses of the oncolytic virus over several uh, days, you know, a few days apart. And just before and just after each 
dose, we, we had a blood sample taken. And then after the virus was given to the patients, a few days later, they had their cancer removed by surgery. And we were then able to get the tumors removed by surgery and look to see if the virus had gone into the cancer. And our main interest in this, in this uh, phase one clinical trial was to see, can we see evidence that the virus activates the immune system? So we've got some real data here. And what we've done here is we take the blood samples and we look in this case at the natural killer cells in the blood. And we look at the cells, uh, look, looking for changes in the cell that says that the cell has been activated. So here's before we give the patient any virus. You can see if you consider this to be the level of activation at the side or the percentage of NK cells, of natural killer cells that are activated, you can see that in the patients beforehand, and this would look the same if you did it, if you did it in a healthy person, you can see that there's not many immune cells activated. One hour after giving the virus, still not many immune cells activated. But when you look 48 hours after giving the virus, you can see that, what's that? 60, 70% of the natural killer cells in the blood have been activated. They've sensed the presence of that virus and the natural killer cells have said, right, yep, yeah, okay, there's something going on here, got activated. And when an NK cell is activated, it does two things. It looks for somewhere to go. So, for example, to the cancer. And it also activates inside itself those killing molecules that you saw killing that tumor cell in the video. So what we think is going on here is by giving these patients the virus, we're boosting their natural killer cell activity. It's going to help attack the cancer. And we've done lots of other experiments, of course, showing that those virus activated killer cells do at attack tumor cells, at least, at least in, in the lab setting. And there's lots of clinical trials with these sorts of agents at the moment, okay? Using oncolytic viruses alone haven't really, like, like many things in the early stages, they, they don't seem to do a, a, a great deal on their own, okay? They're, they're very safe. So the patients who had that um, oncolytic virus infusion in that phase one trial, um, a lot of them said they felt a bit fluey. And you can, you can see why, because they're getting a large dose of a virus. It's exactly how you might feel with the flu or with a, with a, with a bad cold, no worse than that. Um, and in fact, they were given a paracetamol and that they felt much better. Those were the kinds of the symptoms of giving the virus. But importantly i mean we weren't measuring outcome in that trial it was just to see how the, the agent worked um, but the, these these viruses don't tend to give you that curative response i think you know we've missed something what else do we need to do apart from giving these viruses and i think what again where the field has really gone in the last few years it's not just about analyzing the cancer cells themselves it's about analyzing the environment in which, in which the cancer cells are sitting more closely okay so i've got a little bit more data in the next slide here we are looks a bit complicated so what we've done here is we've got how many here we've got six patients with ovarian cancer and for these patients, these are, these are patients that are coming into the clinic to have ascites fluid drained. And the ascites fluid comes to the lab and the ascites fluid kind of is a sample of, contains the immune cells that are in and around the tumour. So by looking in the ascites fluid, we can tell what sorts of immune cells are in the, in the cavity and, and are in the presence of the tumour. So here's all the different immune cells. If you like, those are the fire engine types, all the different functions there. And the more blue, the more of those cells there are, you can see. So for example, this immune cell here, the DCs, the dendritic cells, you can see we've got pretty much no DCs in the, in the ascites fluid. We've got some T cells and some NK cells, but, but the, you can see that the one we've got lots of are these things which are called MDSCs or TAMs. Okay, they've got a complicated name. They're called myeloid-derived suppressor cells 
and tumor associated macrophage okay the name doesn't really matter but the really important thing about these cells here is that they are suppressive of the immune system okay so let's let's look a bit further so let's look at that data the t cells are cells that can attack the tumor the nk cells are cells that can attack the tumor the dendritic cells are the cells that help those cells to attack the tumor they are there and they can they can all be activated by oncolytic viruses that's great okay but as i said there's also these cells here that can inhibit the immune response and allow the cancer to grow okay so we've got to change that environment from and try and get rid of these cells if you like and i've, I've tried to illustrate that in the next slide so here we are so think of it as a seesaw and on this seesaw we've got the good cells if you like the good immune cells that we want there to attack the tumor and we've got the bad immune cells that are stopping these cells from attacking the tumor and before immunotherapy you can see there's so many more of these cells the mdscs and tams that they outweigh the action of the killer cells and the cancer is able to grow the object of immunotherapy is to change that balance so what we now want is we want to reduce the number of those suppressive cells and increase the number of cells that can attack the tumor and get that cancer killed by those cells you know we want to tip those scales tip that balance so we've got to get from here to here how are we going to do that that's that's what we want the drug if you like to do so after lots and lots of work in the lab we've identified a molecule that switches those cells on okay so this is a I've, I've just made it a red triangle here so this red triangle helps these cells to get activated and get to the tumor and sit there and inhibit your immune system okay that's that switch what's good is that we've identified a way to switch that bad molecule the red triangle off and i've, I've, I've just got to call this one as a green triangle okay so by giving the green triangle we can stop the red triangle so hopefully we can go from this situation to the virus with the switch the green switch and go to this situation okay and where we've got the killer cells and the bad molecule has been switched off so we've got these cells and not these cells and that's what we're trying to do with our immunotherapy and the way we're going to try and deliver this molecule is using an oncolytic virus so this is a this is a virus that's constructed in the lab it's like one of the oncolytic viruses that we've used before it is one of the oncolytic viruses we've used before but it's been modified in the lab to include a new gene a new gene that includes this switch that switches off these cells so this virus gives us lots of things the virus gets into the cancer cells and kills the cancer cells that's great the virus can activate the nk cells for example that are in the tumor that's great but also with this extra gene in it what it can do is it can switch off those suppressive cells and allowing these cells to act much more efficiently now i think this is this type of situation is especially true in ovarian cancer this is the real challenge in ovarian cancer in that you have this situation where you have a predominantly suppressive inhibitory if you like environment in which the cancer is sitting so the cancer is there it's being recognized by the immune cells but these suppressive cells are stopping them from working efficiently so our immunotherapy aims to change the environment in which the tumor sits using this oncolytic virus with this switch molecule in it if you like so does that strategy work all of the experiments so far of course have been done in the lab in various systems in the lab so what do we know about it yes the virus does get into the cancer cells and kills them like any oncolytic virus would we know that it activates lots of different immune cells including the natural killer cells to also kill the cancer cells 
and most excitingly it does change those populations of inhibitory cells to make them less inhibitory and you can kind of change the environment at least in a in a in a model system to make the environment much more much less suppressive enabling your immune system to work much more efficiently so that's a really encouraging result so that's sort of where we got to what will we be doing in the ovarian cancer action funded project okay so what we've got to do is we've got to learn more about the balance of those good and bad immune cells in the cancer we want to know okay so we know roughly what populations are there we know roughly what sorts of fire engines are there but we want to really understand what they're all doing in much more detail so we're going to using um, using clinical samples we will be identifying the different cells that are there and analyzing them in great detail to try and understand why they're switched off and how they're switched off we're going to test our new oncolytic viruses using improved lab models and samples from patients and we're going to test whether our strategy works in platinum resistant ovarian cancer which of course is a big barrier to, to continued therapy and we're not going to pretend that, our that if all of this stuff works really well we're not going to pretend that that's the be all and end all of it we know that's very unlikely to be the situation and we will again be returning to the idea that probably the best way to do these sorts of therapies in the future will be to combine with other drugs and probably with other immunotherapy agents so for example we could imagine that a therapy might include chemotherapy it might include our oncolytic virus but it might include our oncolytic virus in conjunction with an immune checkpoint antibody similar to the ones it is used in melanoma treatment okay why why has melanoma worked um, already and ovarian cancer is 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 um is proving more difficult and i think i'm going to go back and just show you this slide again i think the reason for that is is that melanoma in melanoma you have a lot more of these cells at present the immune system seems to be able to recognize melanoma much more efficiently so you have more of these cells and less of these cells and this this balance is it's not right over this side in melanoma of course it isn't but it's much more precariously placed and so for melanoma it doesn't seem to take quite so much to tip it from there to there in ovarian cancer you've got a, you've got this different sort of environment in which the cancer cells sit and it's a bit more of a problem or a bit more of a, uh, a, a an effort if you like to tip it to tip the balance to to get those cancer cells killed and i've tried to um i'm going to try and end with a couple of slides that perhaps what it really looks like not what it really looks like but a better model for the way in which we've got to get these drugs to work so it's very useful for i hope you've i hope it's enabled you to try and to see what the sorts of things we're doing is this seesaw type approach it's actually very useful for us to think about uh, it working like this and tipping the balance in favor of the immune system but actually it's probably much more complicated than this and i think it probably looks a little bit more like this okay where those those inhibitory cells might be one component of the stuff you've got to get rid of and then there's all sorts of other things going on all sorts of other factors if you like other immune cells perhaps that are contributing to the immune system not working very well and there's also probably other good cells in there that we're not so knowledgeable about hopefully we'll find out about those in our project but there's probably more going on on this side than we thought previously so what we need to do is is take these away and maybe our oncolytic virus is going to be very good at taking that one away but it's maybe not going to touch the others and so we might get a little bit of benefit but we'll get more benefit if we take another one away so this one might be our approach this one might be the immune checkpoint inhibitor this one might be a, a, a chemotherapy drug this one might be well who knows an, an immune checkpoint antibody taking more things away with each therapy would help tip that balance so combination therapies i think is probably the way in which these things will develop in the future 
Okay, so that's the end of the kind of the sciencey bit. I, I hope I hope you understood that. Um, this is where we're going to be doing the work. So, uh, as I said, I'm from Leeds. This is this is where I would normally work, <laughs> where I hope to work again in the near future. So this is the uh, School of Medicine at the St James's Hospital campus. Also on the same campus is the Leeds Cancer Centre at St James's Hospital, which is one of the biggest cancer hospitals in Europe. As you can see, the sky is always lovely and blue in Leeds. It's been lovely today. I was out in the park earlier this morning with the dog, looked a bit like this. Not even very cold, it was lovely this morning. So that's where we work and I'm, I work with my colleague, Dr. Fiona Errington-May and also not shown in the picture, Dr. Vicky Jennings. And in fact, it's Vicky Jennings who does most of the work in the lab and has come up with a lot of the data so far. This picture was obviously taken before lockdown. I think, I think actually this picture was taken in about sort of March last year, just, just before we had to, had to leave the lab. But we're not doing the project on our own. It's not just a Leeds project. We've got, we're working with other people actually from London. So we're working with um, Professor Ian McNeish, he's probably a name that you've, you've come across because Ian uh, works at the Ovarian Cancer Action Research Centre. He's the director of that research centre at Imperial College and Ian's an ovarian cancer expert. And then we've got my colleague Alan Melcher who used to work in Leeds just down the corridor from me. Alan works now at the Institute for Cancer Research and Royal Marsden Hospital in London and he's an expert in immunotherapy so he's a doctor who does immunotherapy and we're also working with Susanna Banerjee from, from ICR and the Royal Marsden who's another ovarian cancer expert. So myself I'm the immunologist Fiona Errington May from Leeds is the oncolytic virus um, scientist, if you like. Alan Melcher is the immunotherapist. He's the person who, who does the treatments, who, who designs the therapies. And uh, Susanna and Ian are the ovarian cancer experts. So we're kind of hoping that all those people together should, should we've got lots of resources and, uh, together and uh, lots of expertise to help move the project forward. And I've got one last slide to show you, and that's this. Just in case you wondered, are the labs working at the moment? And I'm very pleased to say, yes, they are. They've been working very well for a few months. Uh, well, since, since last summer, we, had, we obviously had some time when we couldn't go into work, couldn't use the labs at all, uh, but that was all sorted out. Uh, new regulations about the number of people that can be in the lab at any one time. And of course you have to wear you have to wear a face mask in the lab but yeah work is work is carrying on and it's working very well now it's only people like me who who don't really need to work in the lab but can work quite happily at home on their computer that, that don't get to go in and i think that's the end thank you very much for listening thank you very much for your support from ovarian cancer action and uh, i'll try and answer any questions that you might have Thank you so much, Graham. That was a really fascinating insight into your team's work. And I think you broke down the science really beautifully. So thank you very much. Um, and I really love the fire engine analogy. I love a good analogy. <laughs> and um, I liked how you explained trying to tip the balance in favour of the immune cells when the tumour has provides the immunosuppressive environment and also mm. explaining why immunotherapies haven't been successful yet in ovarian cancer so yeah that that was really fantastic and um, so we're going to move on to questions now and we've had some really good questions in through the Q&A so so the first one we have is does immunology depend on specific gene mutations or just the type of cell that's a very good question and i think the answer is all of those so um, another reason, for example, that, that melanoma has, has proven to be um, very responsive to immunotherapy is that in fact the melanoma, melanoma cancers have, have lots and lots and lots of mutations in them. And lots and lots of mutations means that there are lots of genes that are altered from, from the rest of your body which means it actually makes it easier for the immune system to spot. So cancers with lots and lots of mutations tend to be, have more immune cells in them and tend to be a bit more responsive to immunotherapy. 
in ovarian cancer, you have fewer mutations than you do in melanoma, and you have this immunosuppressive environment. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a mixture of the two. So you've got the, the mutations in the genes affects the ability of the immune system to recognize an attack and also the cellular environment in which the cancer sits affects the immune system stability. So it's, it's both of those. Great, thank you. Um, and then we've had another question in, will you be looking at all types of ovarian cancer in your research? So that's a question we get quite a lot in these webinars. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's another really good question. Um, so at the moment, uh, the, the the work will be focused primarily on high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And that is because um, it's probably got the biggest clinical need uh, and is, 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 is the more common type. Um, it's, so we will be, we will be focusing on, on, on that cancer. But what we think actually is that the, because actually we're not studying the cancer itself. We're not, so concerned well we're not analyzing the different sorts of tumors we're not analyzing the tumor biology itself we're analyzing the immune system around it if you like so what we think is or what we what we hope we don't know yet is that actually a lot of the things that we find for high-grade serous ovarian cancer about the environment in which the cancer might sit might be very similar for other types of ovarian cancer so we would hope to be able to 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 find that out later on uh, and, and, and decide whether or not this sort of approach uh, would be applicable to other types of ovarian cancer. I think probably, although the, you know, we might find that it's not quite the right approach for other types of ovarian cancer, I think it will be a proof of principle that will enable us to say, okay, it's not quite the same, but we could fiddle with it because the basic principles of what's going on are very similar. So we can adapt the therapy maybe to other types of ovarian cancer. A little bit like the way we've heard lots and lots about, okay, we've got the, the COVID vaccine that works against the original strain and it seems to work against this Kent variant, uh, but it might not work so efficiently against the South African variant. But don't worry because we can adapt the vaccine similar sort of approach, similar biology behind it, but we can adapt the vaccine uh, in order to cope with the, with, the, with the South African variant, if you like. So we kind of hope that the principles that we establish will enable us to, to widen the applicability of this sort of approach. That was a very long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> no, that was, that's really fascinating. I've never thought about it like that before, that you wouldn't have to do completely separate experiments for each cancer type that there's going to be a lot of common factors with those cancers and a lot of the same things happening so i, th I think comparing it to the the vaccine development is um is really good so no thank you graham um and then we ha we've got another question this is quite a difficult question to answer um but it is it's an important question so what time scales might you expect good results from such treatments in the real world Okay, so that, yeah, again, that's a really good question. And we get asked this sort of question a lot. And I, and I have to put my hand up and, and I say, I'm a, I'm a basic scientist. I'm not a clinician. What we're doing is, it's what we call translational research. So we're trying to learn the biology that will enable us to translate it into a clinical application. What we've tried to do with this project is um weight it in our favor or not weight it in our favor weight it in the favor of the patient because what we're not really trying to do is invent whole new therapies what we're trying to do is adapt agents that are already developed for clinical use so a lot of the oncolytic viruses that we use in the lab are already made by various biotech companies and are in lots of clinical trials around the world now we are going to adapt those so there will be it will take a little bit of time to get those to, to the point of putting them into patients which we've tried to make it so that it's relatively or quicker from lab to patient but we still could be several years away from clinical trials and i think um one example i learned about recently of speeding up from the the science biomedical research to the translation to patient patient benefit is 
I've heard that they, they grow um, tissues in the lab called, is it called organoids? So yeah. they're always trying to test the research on on tissue that resembles the human more to kind of help speed up that pipeline. Is that correct? Yeah, so one of the things that, that we do um, is to, we, when, we, when we have that ascites fluid from patients, we can use it to analyze the immune cells, but also within the ascites fluid are lots of the tumor cells themselves. Yeah. And you, you can actually use the, the, the cells from the ascites fluid to grow they're like organoids. They're, we call them spheroids. Yes. So they're yes. like little balls of, of tumor cells that we can grow in the lab and we use those as targets, if you like, for our oncolytic viruses and for our immune cells. So we, we do use um, rather than so lo, lots of lots of biomedical research uses cancer cell lines that have been grown in everybody's lab for years and years and years and years. And those those are really useful models. OK, they are very useful but they might not, they might have drifted a little bit away from the actual situation in the patient. So by using patient samples as part of our model, we're able to, I think, again, be a bit closer to the real situation in the patient. And one of the reasons we're, we're working with Ian McNeish at Imperial is because Ian has also spent a lot of time developing improved models that more closely mimic uh, the, the disease in order to get things right in the laboratory. Great, thank you Graham. Um, we're getting lots of questions for you, so are you okay to answer hmm. a few more? Of course. Uh, so we've had one in that says, are there any side effects with this treatment? Um, in boosting the immune system, will it attack other parts of the body? Which is a really fantastic question. Yeah, that's that again, brilliant question. And in fact, probably the, so if you look at um, I'm going to I'm going to keep going back to melanoma because that's where we have most of the data from, and yes, so you do get you do get side effects with immunotherapy, and for exactly that reason. So what you're doing with the immunotherapy with those things called immune checkpoint blockers is you're taking the brakes off the immune system, if you like, and that break is there for a reason. It's there in in to to stop your immune system damaging healthy tissue. So there's a fine balance. It's all down to balances again. There's a fine balance between activating the, or releasing the break on the immune system enough to let it attack the tumor, but it, you don't want it to attack the healthy tissue as much. Now, that balance is very, very close. And you do get side effects with these, with these immune checkpoint drugs. You do, you can get things like, you can get very bad skin rashes. Mm. You can get um, uh, gut if, bad gut effects, so terrible diarrhea. Um, and you can get more serious effects than that, um, where you, you do start to attack the, the healthy individual. And this is, this is a big area of research that people are trying to improve. Unfortunately, that's, that's kind of what you're doing. You, that's exactly what you're trying to do in a way. You're trying to get the immune system to attack your own cells, the cancer cells. It's getting that balance just right. That's that's tricky. But the, the, yeah, it, it, it does have it does have some some severe side effects. But it also it does work really well in melanoma. And when I say it works really well in melanoma. Again, we all hold up melanoma as being great, fantastic, there you go, that's sorted. That's still not the case. So with melanoma, probably about 50 to 60% of melanoma patients respond to these, these immunotherapies. And there's lots of research going on into what makes uh, a, a patient resistant to the immunotherapy or what makes a patient's cancer resistant to immunotherapy. So we've still got a lot to learn there as well. Great, thank you, Graham. And I'm conscious of time, so I thought it would be nice to end on a few of the comments that have been sent in. Um, so someone said, thank you, that was great. I'm currently studying a biology degree in the hope of going into cancer research. So it's really interesting to be introduced to immunotherapy. So I think you may have just persuaded a young potential researcher into the immunotherapy field which is fantastic I, I that's a success then as far as i'm concerned <laughs> that's, that's great 
And then someone else has said a really big thank you for making it interesting and, and also understandable, quite an achievement. And I agree, that was a, that was a really fantastic breakdown. So I, we, I appreciate you kind of starting off explaining what immunotherapy is and then going into your research. And it's, it's just an excuse for me to show pictures of fire engines. Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, we also had a comment about the video. They, they loved the video as well. So. Good, good. Well, I think we'll leave it there as we're starting to run out of time. But thanks again to everyone for joining us this evening. And a massive thank you to Graham for taking the time um, to present this webinar for us. If you'd like to see what other research sessions we have coming up in the next month, you can visit our website. And we've got some, we've got other really good sessions as well. I'd be really grateful if you could complete a quick post webinar survey with your thoughts on the session via the email I'll send out to you straight after. And the feedback, the feedback helps us to make the sessions more relevant and engaging for you all. But you probably can agree that this session couldn't have been more engaging. It was fantastic. So have a great evening, everyone. And hopefully I'll see you again at a few future sessions. So thank you, Graham. And thank I you hope very everyone much. has a good evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.